welcome everybody to my uh, thesis defense. Uh, it's going to be on feldspar recycling across magma wash bodies during the voluminous half dome and cathedral peak stages of the Ptolemy intrusive complex. Many of you guys were here for Melissa's talk on Monday working in the same area, so think of it as a continuation. Um, so um, here's a bit of an outline about what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to introduce you to um, what we know and what we don't know currently about plutons, uh, these uh, magma bodies that are emplaced into the crust and then crystallized. Um, some uh, background information about the Ptolemy intrusive complex, uh, what is currently viewed about uh, pluton placement and uh, single mineral studies, which is what uh, the focus of this talk is. Um, hypotheses for uh, emplacements and the methods and uh, some of our results in the discussion for what they mean for pluton emplacement. So to start off, what we generally know about um, plutons, we're all taught that plutons are these, um, are these magma bodies that uh, rise up and get uh, emplaced into the crust. But what we generally agree on now is that they're constructed through multiple pulses, just thermodynamically and um, based on ages, it's very improbable that any of these bodies could be emplaced as one single pulse of large pulse of magma. Um, but what we do not know is the maximum extent of uh, these magma reservoirs. Uh, did they form a very large um, interconnected uh, magma mush bodies or magma chambers? Or did each of these pulses uh, get in place to crystallize really quickly and not yeah, have time for any sort of uh, formation of an extensive magma mush body? Um, so the area of focus, the broad area of focus right now is the uh, Sierra Nevada Batholith, um, uh, the quintessential uh, continental magmatic arc that's discussed uh, when we talk about subduction zones and all the features. Um, this uh, magmatic arc in Sierra Nevada Batholith is composed of multiple intrusive suites that were in place throughout the Mesozoic era. Um, uh, and it was, uh, these were in place uh, episodically uh, through uh, very specific uh, flare-up events, um, but particularly during the Cretaceous, the very end of the Mesozoic era is where we see uh, the, the largest abundance of ages uh, for uh, intrusive suites. Um, and uh, the specific pluton or, uh, or uh, uh, intrusive suite that we're focusing on is uh, right here in the Ptolemy intrusive complex. Um, so, Ptolemy intrusive complex has been studied pretty widely. It is among one of the youngest um, intrusive suites within the uh, Sierra Nevada Batholith. Um, it is a very extensive in age, uh, 95 to 85 million years old, so at the very end of the Lake Cretaceous. Um, it's a 10 million year lifespan, so it's, it was a very active pluton for a long time. Um, it's also a very uh, large pluton. It's uh, approximated at uh, 1,100 square kilometers. Um, and much of this uh, pluton is within the uh, Yosemite National Park boundaries. Um, what is very special about this intrusive suite is it is a compositionally zoned um, uh, intrusive suite. Um, it's composed of uh, units uh, at the margin which are more uh, felsic, or not more felsic, more mafic, uh, about as mafic as you can get in a granite or a granitoid. And, oops, sorry about that. And uh, they become more felsic towards the center. Um, and this is also related to age. The outer margins are much older, and the central units are much uh, are the youngest. Um, overall, this, uh, this uh, intrusive complex is composed of five major units. So the oldest uh, of, the, of these units uh, out of the margins is the granite diorite of Kuna Crest. Um, it is uh, estimated age 95 to 92 million years old. Um, one character, some characteristics about this uh, specific unit is um, it's composed of anhedral mafic minerals, particularly hornblende and biotite, um, as well as and titanite also uh, is anhedral as well. Um, what is also characteristic is uh, it is composed of uh, interstitial uh, potassium feldspar, which we abbreviate as K-feldspar. Um, so interstitial meaning um, it fills in the gaps between these uh, already crystallized uh, grains. Um, also within this unit, and really within all other units, we do see um, anhedral quartz aggregates and euhedral plagioclase. And since, this is, since these two types of minerals uh, span and cross the entire Tuolumne, I'm not really going to talk uh, that much about them within other units. 
Um, what is also very interesting about the um, Kuna Crescent unique among these units is compositionally heterogeneous. Um, mostly granite diorite and tonalite, but uh, granites, uh, diorites, and gabbros are also present. Um, and here's an example of the Kuna Crest granite diorite. Um, the next youngest unit is the equigranular half dome granite diorite, which we abbreviate as EHD. Um, it is 92 to 90 million years old. Um, characteristically, it's composed of euhedral horn blend up to one centimeter. Um, and also composed of biotite books, so these stacks of biotite that are also euhedral as well as euhedral titanite. Um, potassium feldspar also has slight differences from Kuna Crest. It is a uh, subhedral and up to uh, several uh, millimeters long on its long axis. Um, and here's an example of the EHD, equigranular half dome granite diorite. Um, next innermost unit is the porphyritic half dome granite diorite, um, 90 to 88 million years old. Um, very similar in terms of uh, mafic minerals to uh, the equigranular half dome granite diorite, um, but these mafic minerals are less abundant. Um, and what is also very distinct, and the reason why we call this a porphyritic half dome granite diorite, is um, potassium feldspar is now a phenocrystic, so much larger in euhedral compared to the ground mass. Um, and at max, it's about uh, four centimeters long. And typically, these phenocrysts also contain mafic mineral inclusions that are oriented um, following the crystallographic structure of K feldspar. And here is an example of uh, one such potassium feldspar outlined right here. You can see the mafic mineral inclusions that uh, orient the shape of the grain. Um, the next youngest and the most voluminous uh, or largest in area, uh, mapping area, is the Cathedral Peak Granite Diorite. It is 88 to 85 million years old. Um, very distinct changes within the Cathedral Peak compared to the other units. Um, biotite is the predominant mafic phase, but it is much smaller and less abundant compared to the half dome granite diorites. Um, Hornblende is typically pretty rare within the Cathedral Peak. Um, and if it's present, is usually smaller than the half dome granite diorites. Um, what is also present is um, K feldspar megacrests, uh, much like the ones that Melissa was talking about, um, that range from four centimeters up to about 15 centimeters long, so pretty large grains. Um, we are not really focused on the megacrests specifically uh, within this study. Um, we're focusing mostly on smaller phenocrysts within the cathedral peak, so around uh, four centimeters. Um, and this is one such mega crisp shown here. Um, oh, and one th other thing is uh, potassium is the um, mega crisp or phenocrisp than the Cathedral Peak uh, are lower mafic inclusions, mafic mineral inclusions. Um, the, the youngest unit is the Johnson Granite Porphyry. Um, one age dates it to about 87 and a half million years, uh, which actually overlaps with the Cathedral Peak. Um, it is uh, classified as a fine grained Luca granite. Um, some megacrysts are present, but uh, these megacrysts have previously been interpreted as antichrists from Cathedral Peak. Antichrists meaning um, grains that uh, were transferred over from a previous uh, ma magma body within the, the interest suite. Um, and here's one such uh, photo of the Johnson Granite Porphyry. Um, so, also described in previous literature are transitional units. Um, so what these are, are uh, these, um, as, as uh, the name implies, are transitions from one unit into the next. Um, contacts between uh, individual uh, units, with the, especially within the Tuolumne, can vary from uh, sharp, which uh, is very similar to contacts between something like a sedimentary rock, where you can walk up to the contact, put your finger on the boundary between two units. Um, or gradational, so transitioning from one distinct unit to the next. Um, and one example of, uh, of such that I'll talk about later is uh, pictured right here, which we, uh, it's the transition between the porphyritic half dome and the cathedral peak, which we abbreviate as CPT, um, and is classified as such uh, based on the presence of euhedral hornblende, similar to porphyritic half dome, as well as megacrystic um, cathedral peak megacrysts. Uh, uh, potassium feldspar. So in general, um, like I said, we're no, uh, 
we've transitioned past uh, thinking of plutons and placed as one big magma blob, um, which leaves us with two um, potential models for um, for uh, gradual emplacement. Um, one such model is uh, the magma mush model or magma mush body model. Um, and in this uh, model, as pictured uh, right here for an idealized magma chamber, we form these extensive magma reservoirs in the shallow crust. Um, and one such feature uh, that forms these reservoirs is continuous magma recharge that remobilizes older crystal rich magmas. And because, and because this recharge interacts with these uh, older uh, bodies and causes uh, remobilization, we do tend to see uh, abundant recycling with each additional uh, injection. And this recycling is shown in these hybrid zones uh, or hybrids that are formed between magmas where uh, these individual magmas mix. Um, an opposite end member of this, uh, which uh, is sometimes called the hot transfer zone model, but uh, I think it here as, a sh as the sheet emplacement model. Um, we, plutons uh, in this model are formed as stacks of sills, so uh, very discrete magma pulses that, uh, that get placed in the crust and then crystallize uh, fairly quickly. And as such, there's really no interaction between these sills uh, during emplacement. Um, and because there's no interaction, we don't form a magma reservoir. Um, and typically, any sort of evolution uh, of the magmas uh, that uh, are found uh, occur below the emplacement level, so not during emplacement. Um, so, so, several single mineral studies have been conducted on the 12 nutrients of complex. Um, we have single mineral studies are uh, very important for. Uh, for uh, studying this uh, pluton, uh, particularly because uh, while whole rock studies can tell us quite a bit about uh, broadly what changes in the magmas, they lack the detail to uh, identify individual um, mixing features. Um, as such, we have to focus on individual minerals. Um, one such mineral that's been focused on is zircon, um, which we've used uh, in the past to determine uh, uranium, to determine ages of these uh, grains using uranium lead, um, ages of these units, uh, my apologies. Um, Coleman et al. had argued that uh, the ages uh, are too long for, or, or too uh, broad for us to have uh, formed a large magma mush body. However, um, Mehmeti et al. 2014 noted that uh, that megacris are present within uh, one of the within several of these units, particularly within the Cathedral Peak Granodiorite, one of the youngest units. Um, you can see here in this figure from Mehmeti et al. 2014 that uh, the older units, uh, the Kuna Crest uh, in the Kuna Crest lobe, Kuna Crest Granodiorite, um, are predominantly uh, populated by autocrists, um, so grains that crystallize within the magma. Um, within the Kuna Crest magma. However, the Cathedral Peak Granodiorite contains autocrists right here, but also several antichrists uh, in ages up to, in fact, the Kuna Crest lobe. So it's incorporating a lot of material from older units. Um, another uh, mineral that's been studied quite widely within the, uh, within the Ptolemy Trusa complex uh, is uh, hornblende. Um, Hornblends uh, have actually been uh, studied for mixing, and uh, and as such, uh, mixed hornblende populations have been identified in uh, some gradational contexts, particularly between the Kuna Crest uh, granite diorite and the equigranular half dome. Um, and even at an outcrop scale, we can find evidence of uh, hornblende being mixed, uh, particularly in this photo from Patterson et al. 2016, uh, where you can see this uh, clot of biotite which is in the shape of hornblende. That's previously been interpreted as possibly a mixed hornblende from a porphyritic half tone, for example, into the Cathedral Peak. And finally, um, one of the focuses of this study, uh, potassium feldspar is uh, being studied for um, evidence of uh, mineral recycling. Um, in Medi et al. 2014, um, it, uh, demonstrated multiple potassium feldspar populations uh, using an element map shown here. Um, they identified four, uh, four morphologies and concentrations based on barium of uh, potassium feldspar. Um, and more recently, of course, um, met several megachrists have been identified as recycling uh, by Chambers et al. to 2020 um, based on uh, differences in zircon ages between the cores and rims of uh, 
um, specific uh, potassium feldspar megacris within the cathedral peak transition. Um, so some hypotheses for uh, for emplacement. Um, generally, this uh, this field evidence uh, does seem to support uh, magma mush body formation at the emplacement level, but we want to be 100% sure. So we're using feldspars uh, to determine that. Um, one thing that uh, we want to look for is not just the presence, uh, well, one, the presence of uh, mixed feldspar populations within units, but we also want to see the extent of them, particularly uh, how limited are they to uh, over, a, over a horizontal area. Um, are they limited to gradational zones or are they found throughout the, throughout the units? Um, if uh, one third option is we could have pre-emplacement mixing, so mixing somewhere below the emplacement level, if uh, this uh, were to happen on the very extreme scale, um, whoop, uh, we, would, we would see mixed minerals distributed throughout the units haphazardly. Um, so some of the methods that we used um, to uh, obtain our data, uh, of course, uh, mapping was a big uh, portion of this to determine context as well as sampling. Um, we used XRF, uh, X-ray fluorescence, to determine whole rock compositions. Um, we used a method called cathodoluminescence to uh, scout for potentially um, distinct uh, feldspar morphologies um, based on zoning. Um, and we also used uh, the, the electron microprobe and laser ablation inductively coupled uh, mass spectrometry or LAICPMS to determine uh, trace element abundances in feldspars. Um, and uh, right here in this photo is uh, Valley and myself uh, at the LAICPMS at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. So the first results, uh, so from mapping, uh, first off I wanna mention that uh, I was specifically focused on mapping within the southeastern section of the Tuolumne, um, the transition from the Kuna crest lobe into the main batholith. Um, and the reason why we're focused here is this is where all of the units are exposed over relatively uh, short horizontal distances. Um, within this zone, we were able to find gradational zones between all three of the major units. Um, the first of which, uh, and the oldest of which, the Kuna Crest uh, Grand Diorite Transition, which we abbreviate as KCT, is uh, shown right here. Um, and it is uh, very extensive. Um, what this uh, transition is defined by is um, the presence of anhedral mafic minerals and a low abundance of euhedral biotite. Um, the transition from equigranular half dome into porphyritic half dome, which we abbreviate as EHDT. Um, is shown right here, and it is defined by uh, one to two centimeter potassium feldspars that are starting to show um, uh, um, mafic mineral inclusions and a lower abundance of euhedral mafic minerals in the ground mass compared to uh, equigranular half dome. Um, this transition is not uh, is uh, mostly continuous, but it does thin out to a sharp contact. Uh, this is an example of one such sharp contact that I wanted to show. Um, between uh, equigranular half dome and porphyritic half dome. And finally, we have a continuous uh, transition between porphyritic half dome and cathedral peak, which is defined though, as uh, CPT. And this is where we tend to see not just um, potassium feldspar megacris, but a high concentration of them. And many of them also contain um, mafic mineral inclusions that are crystallographically oriented like the porphyritic half dome phenocrysts and within the ground mass is when we see um, euhedral mafic minerals such as biotite and hornblende which is very similar to porphyritic half dome so um, we did uh, use uh, whole rock uh, whole rock data to classify uh, each of our samples um, using uh, middlemost 1994's classification scheme. Um, we found that most of the units uh, classify as uh, granodiorites as expected. However, some plot as uh, quartz monzonites uh, on the lower uh, uh, alkali end, and also some plot as uh, granites um, on the lower silica end. Um, generally, what is observed is uh, is that the rocks, of course, become more uh, become more silicic as we move from margin to center. Um, 
However, one exception to this that I want to note is EHDT, the transition between equigranular half dome and porphyritic half dome, which uh, plots as a granite more stilistic than both, uh, than both of its uh, neighbors, uh, equigranular half dome and porphyritic half dome. And this is uh, quite interesting because if this is a mixture or if this was a mixture of these two units, we would expect it to plot right in the middle, uh, right in between these two. Um, so potassium feldspar under uh, cathodal luminescence. Um, real quick, I want to introduce you guys to cathodal luminescence uh, since some of you guys may not have uh, seen what it looks like. Um, so what we do is we take thin sections of rocks, uh, uh, put them in a vacuum sealed chamber, and uh, these individual grains or these thin sections are bombarded with electrons uh, from an electron gun, and it causes each of these uh, grains to luminesce. Um, based on their trace elements and their crystal structures. Um, generally, uh, potassium feldspar lights up as blue, um, the varying shades. Plagioclase is usually green to brown, sometimes red um, in very extreme cases. Um, apatite, um, in the case of the Tuolumne plot, um, shows up as a yellowish green right here. Um, quartz uh, is weakly luminescing, so it shows up navy blue. And mafic minerals, such as hornblende, biotite, um, and titanite uh, also does this as well, uh, just don't luminesce at all, so they appear like a jet black. Um, what we found was that potassium feldspar um, of uh, individual units have very distinct zoning patterns. Um, in the uh, equigranular half dome, for example, as shown in this, uh, this image of a, uh, of a thin section under cathodal luminescence, potassium feldspar is, uh, we know it's subhedral, um, it actually shows what we call a simple zonation pattern. So uh, the zoning apply, uh, shows up as a bright blue in the center, but in the margins, it shows up a much dimmer blue. Um, this is consistent throughout the equigranular half dome, but it's also shown in the transition between the Kuna Crest and equigranular half dome, KCT. In contrast, um, phenocrystic potassium feldspars, particularly from porphyritic half dome, as well as Cathedral Peak Transition and Cathedral Peak, um, show what we call an oscillatory zonation. So it uh, shows a sort of a tree ring-like pattern where we have these spikes in um, these very thin uh, bright blue rims that start to grade out and turn darker blue, followed by another um, bright blue uh, rim and then uh, grading out and so on and so on. Um, what is very interesting is these uh, bright blue bands also seem to align with uh, these uh, mineral inclusions. Now, plagioclase, as I stated, uh, shows up as green to brown to red under cathodal luminescence. Generally, the cores of these uh, grains appear more green than the rims, which uh, show up more of a brown. Um, and uh, Marshall, uh, 1976, uh, has interpreted this as caused by uh, manganese and iron substitution within the crystal structure. Um, in contrast with what we see in potassium feldspar, there's really no systemic variation in colors between units. Um, throughout all the units, um, they appear to have uh, some combination of uh, brown to green, but there's really no clear trend deciphered. Um, what I did notice was that several thin sections, although these are quite rare, do have these brighter green cores compared to the other grains. Um, and as it turns out, these actually correspond with what look like resorbed cores uh, in, under a petrographic microscope. Now, um, we also looked at the chemistry of uh, feldspars, particularly the um, in this case, uh, potassium feldspar, um, and we show them as uh, rim to core uh, transects, the rims uh, being out at the, where it says, uh, out at the origin, and the core is plotting out here. Um, we're looking at barium zonation, um, when looking at the ground mass potassium feldspar, particularly which shows up as simple zonation in uh, cathodal luminescence, um, the barium uh, contents appear to mimic that as well. Um, we start off with higher barium in the cores, and the rims tend to have low barium with no major interruptions. Um, likewise, uh, with potassium feldspar phenocrysts that show up as oscillatory zoned in cathodal luminescence, we do tend to show uh, an oscillatory zonation pattern of uh, barium. Um, 
likewise, uh, barium isn't the only element that uh, follows this pattern. Um, yttrium, zinc, and strontium also follow this pattern quite well, and europium, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, one thing that was noticeable about the phenocris is there is also a very distinct uh, difference in barium concentration between porphyrocaptum and Cathedral Peak phenocris. Um, porphyrocaptum can sometimes have um, can sometimes have uh, barium concentrations that are up to almost two weight percent, so about 2,000 ppm. Um, whereas we don't tend to see that as much within uh, the Cathedral Peak phenocris, which uh, sometimes go up to about one parts per million or one weight percent or one or 10,000 uh, ppm. Um, this distinction is notable because um, we also looked at a Cathedral Peak transition phenocris, and this seems to show some sort of combination of the two. The core is very high barium, um, up to about 18,000 uh, uh, parts per million, and at about four millimeters from the rim, we tend we it starts to flatten out, uh, in some cases gradually decreasing to 2,000 uh, parts per million. Um, now, other elements don't necessarily show this. Uh, rubidium, for example, um, shows uh, particularly in the um, Simples uh, in the uh, ground mass potassium feldspar that's prevalent in equigranular half dome, we uh, it tends to show a very um, non uh, a very uh, straight or a horizontal um, pattern. Uh, there's really not much of a change in rubidium in equigranular half dome and uh, uh, Kuna crest transition. Same thing with uh, equigranular half dome transition. However, one thing that is notable. Um, we're doing this to actually see if there's any sort of overlap between these transitions and uh, their neighboring major units. Um, equigranular half dome transitions, uh, rubidium contents are considerably higher and consistently higher than equigranular half dome, um, which means that probably they might not be related based on, uh, based on these rubidium uh, contents. Um, now, phenocris, in terms of rubidium content, um, Show very con show very similar uh, patterns uh, to each other. Um, they actually start off with very low rubidium, but uh, at usually around the same time as the final as the final um, barium uh, decrease, we tend to see an increase in uh, rubidium concentration. Uh, so just a sharp jump. Um, and finally, I also want to look at titanium. Um, titanium really doesn't vary that much between uh, most of these grains. However, one thing that is very uh, distinct is uh, the Kuna crest transitions. Um, the K feldspar from there, the titanium, um, is consistently higher in concentration than uh, equigranular half dome. Um, and this is also the case with uh, certain light rare earth elements, which, uh, like how uh, the equigranular half dome transition seems to not very, be very similar in terms of K feldspar with equigranular half dome. Um, these two, this transition doesn't seem very similar to equigranular half dome either. So they seem to be very distinct from one another. Now, plagioclase, um, I also wanted to show uh, some of the uh, content ranges. Uh, pre varies pretty widely. Um, usually they plot in uh, the andesine to oligoclase range. And uh, there is uh, quite an overlap in terms of anorthite uh, contents uh, between units. Now we compare anorthite contents with uh, trace elements, we start to see very distinct patterns. Um, one such pattern that's uh, observed is uh, when comparing anorthite content with strontium. Um, what you can see here is sort of a fanning out uh, pattern of all of the units. And what this is caused by is um, very two very distinct uh, anorthite to strontium trends. Um, one such trend is a high, has a higher anorthite uh, range, which is defined by the equigranular half dome um, potassium, uh, potassium plagioclase uh, feldspars, as well as the two neighboring transitions. Um, in contrast, we also have a lower anorthite content range, which is populated mostly by Cathedral Peak and the Cathedral Peak transition. And within this lower anorthite range, we also tend to have considerably higher amounts of strontium, um, up to almost 2,000 uh, ppm, but in some cases even higher. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, porphyritic half dome 
actually plots in between these two trends and overlaps with them. Um, we do see similar separa separation when we compare anorthite content with light rare earth elements. We use cerium here because it is the most abundant of the light rare earth elements in the uh, plagioclase uh, within this uh, intrusive suite. And uh, in general, the, the um, light rare earths show a, po a positive trend uh, when compared with anorthite content. However, different units populate uh, different concentrations. Uh, as it turns out, equigranular half dome and uh, and its transition, as well as uh, the Kuna Crest transition, uh, tend to have the higher uh, cerium contents, uh, usually around 10 to 25 parts per million. Um, in contrast, Cathedral Peak and the Cathedral Peak transition, which seem to overlap here again, uh, plot very low, um, typically uh, around five to almost uh, zero or below detection limit. And like with uh, strontium compared with uh, anorthite content, um, porphyritic half dome overlaps and plots between uh, both of these trends. Now, um, in other units, there's really not very much of a, or in other elements, there's really not very much of a, um, a difference noted um, between units. Uh, for example, with uh, anorthite and uh, barium, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest distinctions is there's pretty wide uh, barium contents with anorthite content. Um, in some cases, a near vertical trend. Um, this is particularly the case with uh, the um, Kuna Crest transition, KCT. Um, and in some cases, uh, equigranular half dome as well. But when we look at other units, there's really, there's really not much of a difference. Similarly with titanium, but uh, titanium uh, is uh, very, is extremely high compared to the other units within uh, KCT as well as uh, uh, equigranular half dome and equigranular half dome transition. Um, with the rest of the units, they actually, there's actually a distinct uh, change in slope um, to a much more shallow slope. Now, um, particularly with the first uh, two elements with light rare earths and strontium, we established that the porphyritic half dome um, plots uh, overlapping two uh, very extreme trends and uh, plots in between. Now, this could be an effect of uh, being part of a mixed magma, or we could actually have uh, two distinct um, populations of plagioclase within the porphyritic half dome. So uh, in order to determine that, I separated them out based on unit. And what's shown here in uh, each of these panels is um, individual grains uh, from specific uh, samples, um, in this case Y31 and L77A, which are taken in two different locations within the porphyritic half dome. There's very distinct um, concentrations um, plagioclase within uh, Y31 uh, plots with equigranular half dome completely, whereas uh, L77A mostly plots with um, Cathedral Peak. Um, similarly, what is also shown here, and I must reiterate, is um, that transitions seem to be very, um, are very similar in concentration in terms of their plagioclase with, um, with their neighboring major units, um, specifically EHDT is very plots with uh, EHD pretty consistently, and CPT plots with CP or Cathedral Peak. Um, several of these uh, grains, of course, uh, plot intermediate um, equigranular half dome and the Cathedral Peak trends, as shown, particularly with Y26 um, and as well with uh, L6A. Um, one thing that I also noted is that um, for the most part, um, where the samples were collected, these samples were, co were collected close to boundaries with um, neighboring transitions. Um, and they seem to mimic, in terms of concentration, the nearest uh, major unit. For example, Y26, uh, which has a good amount of um, equigranular half dome-like uh, grains, was actually collected near uh, EHDT, near Y25, as it turns out. Um, and uh, likewise, L6A was, fly, was collected very similar, was collected very closely with uh, near CPT. 
Um, now, I also uh, used plagioclase to interpret some magmatic processes. Um, I uh, determined the plagioclase crystallization temperatures using uh, an equation from Ritchie and Blundy, uh, 2015. Um, and uh, what we found was a pretty wide range of uh, temperatures, um, as shown right here uh, in this uh, panel. Um, they actually uh, range from about 1200 all the way down to the solidus, uh, which is around uh, 650. So a pretty wide range in temperatures. Uh, this is important because um, this shows us these were fairly early crystallizing uh, minerals and would uh, thus allow for mixing. Um, we did get some solid, subsolidus values, so like below the solidus, um, which would normally be um, uh, correspond with uh, metamorphic temperatures. However, um, it is possible that this equation was just not calibrated for uh, late stage melts, which is uh, what these uh, most likely interpret. As it turns out, a lot of these uh, subsolidus temperatures correspond with REMS of uh, plagioclase grains. Um, we also determined the melt composition that was in equilibrium with the plagioclase grains as they formed. Um, the reason why we want to know this is uh, we really want to know if these whole rock, uh, if these whole rock samples actually represent complete melts, or is it possible we could have formed a cumulate, so like an accumulation of crystals that were separated out from the magma. Um, we used uh, Scruggs and Baterka, uh, 20, 2018, they had an equation to determine um, silica content of a melt that was in equilibrium with plagioclase. Um, and what was determined was the silica content of this melt was ranged from um, 68 to almost 87 weight percent. Uh, this 87 weight percent, probably above calibration range. Um, it's very unlikely we'd get something that high. But what is notable is um, if you look at each of these, uh, each of these uh, points um, compared with the whole rock uh, in the yellow um, points, the uh, calculated melt composition is, consistent, is almost consistently higher than the whole rock analyses, which tells us something is going on. Um, we did the same thing for trace elements, specific trace elements. Um, we used uh, distribution coefficients from a rhyolite and uh, the one from a rhyolite and one from a rhyodacitic melt um, to compare uh, to compare uh, melt compositions. Um, specifically, we focused on the cores of grains uh, because these are the most are the least affected by uh, fractionation um, and uh, of uh, other minerals um, within the melt. And what we found was um, in the case of strontium and rubidium. Um, the calculated melt compositions uh, were, consi were consistently higher, from the, or near consistently higher than the analyzed, uh, they're actually, uh, let me rephrase, uh, the uh, strontium and rubidium concentrations of the melt were actually uh, lower than the corresponding whole rock uh, analyses, uh, which tells us that something was removed from the melt um, to give us these whole rock compositions. Um, barium and zinc were also analyzed. However, the uh, results aren't as consistent. Um, barium in a melt uh, calculated uh, using a rhyolite um, uh, distribution coefficient is consistently lower than the whole rock uh, analyses. Um, not the same case with uh, rhyodacite. As it turns out, um, uh, distribution coefficients for barium and plagioclase vary widely, so it's a little bit more difficult to determine. Um, zinc uh, has a lot of scatter, as it turns out. Um, overall, it, uh, overall um, zinc is, uh, many of the zinc uh, concentrations are lower in melt compared with uh, whole rock, but there is a lot of scatter, so it's a little bit more difficult to determine. So moving on to uh, the discussion, we um, created this uh, image um, to, to illustrate how uh, crystal popula how feldspar populations are distributed throughout each unit. One thing that is very noticeable is plagioclase and potassium feldspar uh, are vastly different in uh, their mixing patterns. Um, while plagioclase shows uh, one, a wide population of uh, of a single type within uh, several different units. Um, it also shows uh, mixing within some units as well. Um, potassium feldspar, on the other hand, uh, seems to show um, 
specific compositions that are uh, distinct to an individual unit, with one exception, um, which is uh, cathedral peak transition. So breaking down um, each part of the uh, of this image, um, what we determined was that uh, the Kuna crest transition equigranular half dome, the potassium feldspar are not the same. Um, and that is based on the differences in titanium concentrations. Um, titanium is much higher in the potassium feldspar here than it is uh, in here in equigranular half dome. Um, the plagioclase, on the other hand, seems to be very similar. Um, while the Kuna crest transition plagioclase is higher in uh, trace element concentration and generally in anorthite content, they seem to fall along the same uh, fractionation array. So it suggests that they are uh, related somehow. They may, have, they may have formed from the same melt. Um, the other transition in this area, the equigranular half dome transition, EHDT, um, like KCT, possesses very distinct um, potassium feldspars mm -hmm. from equigranular half dome. This is based on rubidium concentration. Um, however, the plagioclase are virtually the same. There's no distinction between the two. Um, what we interpret from this based on not just the feldspar compositions, uh, but also based on the whole rock uh, compositions is that uh, equigranular half dome transition, EHDT, is really just a fractionated uh, equigranular half dome granodiorite. That's how we ended up with uh, a granite compared to an equigranular, to, compared to a granodiorite but uh, also different potassium feldspars compared with plagioclase. Um, plagioclase is an earlier phase, so it probably was already crystallized before potassium feldspar, which is generally viewed as a late phase or later phase. Um, porphyritic half dome, uh, like I said before, but I'll uh, reiterate, um, has mixed populations that are similar to uh, Cathedral Peak as well as equigranular half dome. Um, and thus, based on that, uh, we were able to we determined that it is actually a mixture of those two units, um, specifically based on um, what's uh, neighboring the porphyritic half dome and evolved echogranular half dome, uh, which is recorded as EHDT, and uh, cathedral and uh, perhaps a, a more primitive um, cathedral peak, an earlier stage of cathedral peak. Um, Potassium feldspar, on the other hand, is very distinct um, in uh, porphyritic half dome compared to cathedral peak. So we are thinking that uh, the, that this potassium feldspar had to have crystallized after mixing uh, was uh, had happened. Um, so it crystallized from a mixed melt. However, um, there was mixing from uh, from porphyritic half dome into cathedral peak uh, transition based on the specifically the barium profile of uh, this uh, uh, CPT grain. And what this tells us is uh, the cathedral peak had to have been in place through, um, through multiple batches. Um, that is uh, similarly noted, uh, similarly based on how, um, how cathedral peak-like grains are closer to cathedral peak within the porphyritic half dome and vice versa with the uh, equigranular half dome. And uh, finally, we do, one thing I did not mention is we do actually see um, equigranular half dome like grains, we want one grain specifically in uh, Cathedral Peak, um, and as well as these uh, very, very high strontium cores. Um, and what we're interpreting this is uh, that with each magma batch, um, we do see increased mixing into uh, this younger magma. So compared with, um, so comparing with uh, other, um, whoop, too far forward, um, compared with other minerals, um, the plagioclase uh, compositions within the equigranular half dome are, it's pretty much one composition, and this agrees with Hornblend uh, as interpreted from uh, Barnes et al. 2016. Um, however, Barnes et al. 2016 did find two Hornblend populations within uh, the Cathedral Peak transition, um, whereas we only found one plagioclase uh, composition. So um, it is possible that this composition only reflects equigranular half dome, um, and maybe earlier uh, plagioclases uh, were had uh, formed but were uh, left away in accumulate, or it's possible that uh, 
that uh, Kuna Crest and uh, Ecuador Haptum really just had a, a similar composition of plagioclase. Um, mixing from uh, the porphyritic haptome into the cathedral peak transition uh, based on potassium feldspar um, specifically seems to agree with uh, zircon ages of uh, Chambers et al. Uh, 2020. They also found that uh, uh, one megachrist, uh, or actually two megachrists, had recycled from porphyritic haptome to the cathedral peak based on um, ages of uh, zircons from the cores and the rims of these megachrists. And finally, um, increased mixing of plagioclase uh, towards the cathedral peak um, agrees with uh, the increased uh, antichristic zircon abundance that was determined, that was uh, noted by uh, Mimedi et al. Uh, 2014. Um, based on our calculations of uh, temperature and uh, melt abundances, um, Plagioclase temperatures uh, suggest that it is an early uh, precipitating phase and it crystallizes all the way down to the solidus, um, thus signif uh, recording a significant portion of the magmatic history and thus allowing it for it to be mixed more easily. Um, melt calculations uh, contrast in several elements with uh, whole rock, and uh, this agrees with uh, results by Wurtz et al. Uh, 2020, who uh, looked at horn blend, uh, particularly in uh, uh, several um, plutonic bodies, and they determined that the melt uh, did not correspond with the whole rock. Um, in our case, uh, we saw higher strontium in, uh, in uh, the whole rock uh, analyses compared with the melt, the calculated melt, and that suggests plagioclase accumulation, particularly because strontium is uh, generally most abundant in plagioclase. Um, biotite accumulation could be responsible for rubidium as well as zinc and barium uh, concentrations being higher in uh, the in whole rock and now samples uh, compared with melt. Um, but one thing I will note is that these uh, three elements are also compatible in other minerals as well. Uh, zinc, for example, is compatible in, uh, in um, iron oxides. So based on the data that we've uh, accumulated, we can, we've come up with a schematic model for how uh, the Ptolemy intrusive complex was uh, formed in the, each of the stages. Um, so our first stage, um, we uh, start off by forming the Kuna Crest uh, Grand Dire in all of its various compositions, which uh, start off as uh, sheet-like bodies. Um, and uh, during the final stages of the Kuna Crest, the Echorino Half Dome uh, was in place and mixed to form the Kuna Crest Transition, or KCT. Um, once the equigranular half dome was uh, in place and started crystallizing, started uh, forming a, a, a fractionated granite uh, within the center of the magma body. And during this time is when we start to uh, in place uh, the first batches of the Cathedral Peak. And Cathedral Peak mixed with equigranular half dome. Half dome to form the porphyritic half dome, porphyritic half dome potassium feldspars to get recycled into new batches of cathedral peak magma. Excuse me, Lewis, yep. uh, you froze for just like 20 seconds. Um, would you just go back to the last panel and repeat what you just said in case? People um, the the one? stage three? Uh, uh, sta why don't you go to stage two? Sure. Um, so, to, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, at stage two, the cathedral. Um, we start off uh, with uh, an equigranular half dome that is fractionating into a uh, into a granite, which is recorded as a EHDT. And during this time, um, Cathedral Peak um, is uh, the first stage of magma batches of the Cathedral Peak are being emplaced and uh, thus forming a mixture with equigranular half dome to form porphyritic half dome. Um, and in stage three. Um, as we're continuing to crystallize porphyritic half dome, which is forming these uh, potassium feldspar um, phenocrysts, um, later stages or later batches of Cathedral Peak are being in place, uh, which allows for recycling of these porphyritic half dome uh, phenocrysts to, into uh, the Cathedral Peak magma. And uh, so 
Um, in conclusion, uh, the presence of uh, mixed uh, plagioclase in the porphyritic half dome demonstrates prolonged emplacement level interactions between two distinct magma bodies um, in multiple batches, these two distinct magma bodies being equigranular half dome and, uh, um, uh, and uh, cathedral peak. Furthermore, melt loss and crystal accumulation uh, determined from melt composition calculations uh, would not have likely occurred if uh, magma had solidified quickly into sheets. It would have required uh, much more, uh, much longer amounts of time. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the Tuolumne intrusive complex was in place through a series of increasingly voluminous uh, magma bodies and uh, thus it formed a magma mush body that was similar to those uh, feeding the large uh, volcanic eruptions. Thus, uh, this supports uh, the magma mush uh, emplacement model. Uh, so here's some of my references. Um, I also want to, so uh, before we finish, I wanted to give some acknowledgments. Um, uh, these are all people that uh, helped me uh, with uh, getting uh, acclimated with this project and with uh, data analyses. Rosario Esposito at, uh, Dr. Rosario Esposito at uh, UCLA, uh, where I used the microprobe uh, several times. Um, Drs. Cal Barnes, uh, Melanie Barnes, and Kevin Wirtz at uh, uh, Texas Tech University. Um, helped me with uh, uh, learning how to use the LACPMS and also with uh, data interpretation uh, during, this, um, during the manuscript stages of this project. Um, Dustin Williams, Katie Ardell, uh, Anna Martinez, they all helped me with uh, getting acclimated with this uh, project um, as well as data collection. Uh, of course, I have to thank my committee, uh, Dr. Diane Clemens Knott Natal and uh, Natalie Burston and my advisor, Dr. Uh, Valley Mimetti, who, um, really got me started on this project and tolerated me for four years. Um, I want to thank all of the graduate students and undergrads that I've, uh, that I've gotten to know over the last, uh, uh, over these last four years. Uh, some of them came in with me in 2016 uh, and we've been through this journey together. Um, I especially want to thank Melissa Chambers uh, because she helped me a lot with data collection, with sample collection. Uh, and uh, with teaching as well. She's been a very good friend. Same with Jennifer Lielmeyer and uh, Anthony Macias. They've helped calm me down during this time. And finally, uh, I also want to thank uh, some very special people in my life who did not help me with the project but kept me sane for these for the past four years. Uh, my parents um, who are tuning in from, uh, from Las Vegas and uh, the one person who's right here with me, my fiance, John, who uh, picked up his life uh, to move out here with me uh, you know, as I uh, started this journey. And uh, with that, I open this up to questions. Thank you all. Good job, Lewis. Thank, Thank you for you. your talk. Um, Yay, Lewis. Thank you. <laughs> so, Okay, so if you have a question, please uh, raise your virtual uh, screen. Let's see one for Natalie. All right. No, no, that was those were that was applause. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> virtual applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So, uh, any questions? Uh. Oh, uh, hold on Scott. one second. Scott. <laughs> okay. Hello, Lewis. Nice talk. Hi, thank you. Um, I have to confess, maybe I should turn my video on to show you proof here. How do I do that? Yeah, can you guys see, see me now? Yep, yeah, we'll see you. Okay. Hi, Sophie. <laughs> I have a young lady with me, and so I missed about a quarter of your talk, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's okay. <laughs> because she kept me busy. Uh, but I think I caught most of it. And mm -hmm. I have a couple questions, but maybe I'll start with one and come back if other people don't ask things. Okay. okay. So the first one maybe is, you know, you showed that slide uh, from Valley where there were four populations of... Uh, potassium uh, feldspars. Yes, right here. Yeah. So, you know, you didn't find anything like that. So I'm trying to figure out how this fits together. Do you think 
we just have this spatial variation in the number of case bar populations or what's it's, your it's possible. Um, I did find one grain that uh, seemed to be that seemed to be very distinct, particularly in the cathedral peak transition, um, compared with uh, this uh, recycled uh, phenocris that I showed um, in terms of shape. So we do so. I don't know what to say this. It does look like there is another population in there, but I only have one grain of uh, each, so it's so. It's tough to tell necessarily if that makes if that uh, answers your question. Okay, so it may maybe spatial variation, or we just yeah. found them yet. Or, okay, and, and a related question, if I can sneak in one more here quickly, is mm -hmm. I want to want to make sure I understand the sort of mixing story. Is it? Yeah. My understanding that sometimes you do mix crystals mm -hmm. that preserve cores that are distinct. But then other times it seems like what you're really doing is mixing melts and then you're growing the crystal from the new mixed melt. Um, it, so it depends on what feldspar we're talking about. Uh, plagioclase, from what we can tell, uh, seems to show evidence of uh, crystal mixing, especially in the porphyritic half dome. Um, with potassium feldspar, it's a little different in that the only case of mixing that I've seen <laughs> is um, from porphyritic half dome into cathedral peak. Um, other than that, I don't really see any sort of um, distinct uh, mixing patterns from uh, from one unit to the next with in, ter in terms of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, potassium feldspar. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? <laughs> Sophie? Sophie has, Sophie has a question. Oh, shoot, do I, am I still get them? <laughs> yeah, please mute yourself, thank you. Anna. I have a question, yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, Luis, congratulations. Thank you. Oh, that was a lot of fun uh, listening. What you uh, were doing with those uh, different uh, units and especially the single mineral chemistry. Mm -hmm. I have one question for you and it's just uh, curiosity. Why or what explanation you can suggest for uh, the high titanium values and uh, I think it was a cathedral peak unit. It, it was, was quite distinctic. Uh, um, it was, um, what is it, a Kuna Cresta transition. Um, let me see if I can find it right here. So are you referring to this guy right here? Yes. Um, so, We've, so Valley and I have talked about this intermittently. Um, one thing that I'm thinking is a Kuna Crest transition. Um, one, it prob one, it's possible it might have had uh, more titanium to begin with. Uh, but the other thing is um, we know that um, titanite within this, uh, within this unit is uh, kind of a sort of an anhedral shape. So it might just be crystallizing later after plagioclase. So that's one possibility as well. So okay. you're saying that the, the sphene wasn't around yet to suck out the titanium out of the melt. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Luis. You're welcome. And I see Scott has another question. Uh, if nobody else has one, then I'll, you got me thinking about a couple things. Can, can you go back to your map that you showed where you show the transition zones? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah. there's kind of two related questions that popped up in my mm -hmm. head on this one. Okay, and the first yeah, is, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. if you took out the Cathedral Peak, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. what do you think was there before Cathedral? Is it all porphyritic half dome or equigranular half dome or... Hmm. Um, yeah. Or or host rock. So you're talking about like the specific, like what is recorded now as Cathedral Peak. Yeah, where Cathedral now is. You know, if we took that out, we have a big empty hole that had to have something there. 
Um, so what I'm thinking is, um, let me think about this. Um, what I'm thinking is it could be uh, some portions of uh, porphyritic half dome and uh, equigranular half dome. Um, based on what we're seeing, it is possible this is right around the time where uh, cathedral peaks start to coalesce into a much uh, larger body um, as different magmas started to uh, come together. Um, but I'm thinking uh, it's probably uh, some mixture of porphyritic half dome and equigranular half dome. Happy. Okay, and one other quick question, if I may. You know, I've been listening to Cal Barnes and Kevin uh, and the, all about their conclusions, and they've certainly started to argue for smaller and smaller increments to okay. grow the Tuolumne. Mm -hmm. hey, today you presented, uh, hi, Cal and Kevin, I suspect you're out there. Um, and then you've presented evidence for the same. Bye. Okay, but all of you guys conclude that these smaller increments are fairly silicious, fairly uh, felsic with these uh, sort of rhyolitic melts. Okay, so as a structural geologist, that is a challenge for me because mm -hmm. the smaller the increment you make, and the more silicious it is, the harder it is to get it very far. Yes. And so I, I'm not quite sure how you guys are imagining this. Is there another big chamber just underneath the Tuolumne that you're taking increments from? Or well, what are you thinking? Um, well, I love, well, uh, if uh, Cal and Kevin can give input after I answer, it'd be awesome. Um, what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's a possibility. I do, uh, and uh, I, I agree with you, uh, especially considering that silicic melts are pretty um, viscous. It's very difficult for it to get, especially these large bodies in place within the crust. Um, it is possible a technism may be playing a role, but I don't know for certain. Well, what what are the silicic melts really representing, Lewis? Um, um, well, this is a this is a melt that's in uh, equilibrium with plagioclase, um, and based on what the temperatures are showing, it's pretty early melts. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let um, Kevin and and Cal just uh, race yeah. on to uh, Kevin was first. Mm -hmm. I'll let them chime in as well, and then we can talk later. Kevin. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. can hear you. Okay. Hey, Kevin. Um, in regards to Scott's question, um, I, I don't think we're that far off. I think we still need these big bodies in some way. Yeah. Um, what I think we differ is uh, sort of the what the data say and the limitations um, of trying to distinguish some of these things. So mm -hmm. there have to be multiple magma bodies within a unit. I, yeah. I think Cal and I are pretty convinced of that. Um, and so multiple distinct bodies in terms of um, their composition. Um, mixing within a unit, um, we all have evidence for that. Um, and so uh, mineral scale evidence, it's all there, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of what phase you seem to look at. And I think even uh, the potassium feldspar, um, the oscillations in barium and strontium, um, that's evidence of mixing. Um, and so where, where I keep getting hung up is um, how you can distinguish mixing within a unit from mixing between units. Yeah. And uh, that, that's really my big hiccup. Um, and so one of the questions I have for you, Lewis, is yeah. um, you've provided some textual evidence that we can use as markers. Uh, and so the inclusions and the orientations of inclusions in, in feldspars uh, give one means by that chemistry to really um, provide something of a more definitive uh, uh, evidence between units, right? True. Yeah. Um, and you've shown some feldspars, and I don't know that I can um, tell you what slide number it was on, but there's a cathedral peak feldspar that was riddled with uh, inclusions in its interior. Um, uh, and, so are you talking about this guy right here? Uh, no, it, it was a field photo. Um, okay. Anyway, some of these feldspars have um, this, yeah, I think I'll have to move my hand. Uh, yeah, kind of like that. Okay, so okay. 
it, to that feldspar, the core, which if you started analyzing it compositionally, you might be able to tag it to a different unit. But do we see those inclusion-rich cores like that um, in, in the feldspars elsewhere? And that's um, the potassium feldspar, so this is a little different, but you know, the five-day yeah. place, it's the same way. There's, there's textural criteria you can start to use. True. Yeah, I mean, the, really the only textural uh, thing that I've noticed within the grains that I've analyzed is um, there are some um, plagioclases within uh, Cathedral Peak, uh, as mostly in Cathedral Peak, but in some cases, uh, the Cathedral Peak uh, transition, which is really probably the boundary, and Porphyritic Calf Dome, that have um, these really high strontium values, like uh, considerably above uh, 2,000 uh, ppm. Um, and texturally, they're very distinct from their surrounding ground mass. They're also higher in anorthite content. But beyond that, I really haven't uh, seen anything else like it in plagioclase. Um, one of the other things is plagioclase, from what I could tell, um, I wouldn't say rare, but rarely, but uncommonly um, have uh, inclusions within them, at least from the thin sections I looked at. Yeah. If anything, they're probably, uh, from what I can see, uh, they're mostly in the rims of these uh, grains, but in the mo for the most part, uh, inclusions aren't really all that common within plagioclase, within Tuolumne. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I saw somebody else had their hand raised. Was that uh, you? Cal was going to ask something. Okay. Uh, and more of a comment than a question, I think, uh, getting yeah. back to, to Scott's question. Um, I, I think that if, if we put any faith in the temperature estimates that, that you've got, um, then you have a way of addressing part of Scott's question about you know, how these things get put together. Because uh, if we believe the temperature estimates, then yeah. we're looking at the fairly high temperature magmas at the beginning of plagioclase crystallization and um, the the likelihood oh th that lab person is right behind me here <laughs> uh, it's quite likely that these especially the cathedral peak magma had a lot of water in it yeah and so the at high temperatures and a lot of water the melt viscosity was probably pretty low and then the question becomes how what the crystal load was and whether we want to think about there being a you know big crystal load or or relatively small, yes. And um, and this gets back to you know how how we envision these things um, getting together. So um, that in that regard, I, I I think you've got some you've got quite a bit of data that you can use to to go after that. Um, then one one further comment about uh, in answer to or when you answered. Uh, Anna's question about the titanium, I liked your answer, but I don't think it applies <laughs> because, gotcha. because the plagioclase in the uh, in uh, Kuna Crest is is hot. Uh, mm -hmm. The the titanite that crystallized in Kuna Crest barely knew liquid at all. It was very cold. Uh, okay. And so all that titanium was in there um, because, and it's true in the rest of the system too. Okay, so uh, I, I should say I agree with your answer about Kuna Crest, but the same answer applies to everybody else. Mm, so I think okay. it's saying more about the the parental liquid to Kuna Crest being higher in titanium uh, and everybody else being more fractionated. Yeah, and that makes sense. Right. So um, I don't have any other questions, but I wanted to say before I sign off, uh, the, it was a really nice presentation and uh, had a lot of fun watching. And, and um, as you know, I've I've uh, marked up your uh, your uh, manuscript twice now, <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to it uh, heading off to Geosphere. Awesome, thank you, Cal. You bet. Thanks, Cal. Can I add one more thing? Uh, yes. Um, yep. it's just to go back to what Cal was saying about temperatures and. Uh, uh, crystal wounds. This is something at least me and him have had a conversation about a couple times. And um, one of the things I keep getting back to is one of the things I find hard to explain in terms of um, 
what you see in the crystals is the temperature oscillations and the evidence of mixing that you see from um, some spatial distance of growth and the proportion of growth of those crystals that you have. Yeah. So in foreign blend, you know, it's, it's from core to rim, you, you see it in, in these big crystals. Um, and these are small oscillations back and forth, but they're, you know, what I would call evidence of mixing. And so you see the same thing in the potassium feldspars, mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe the flash, but um, it, it says something about what proportion of crystal growth happened during mixing events. And in hornblende, it may have been, you know, there's not that much hornblende in there, and it grows at, you know, above 800 degrees or, you know, above 750 um, for the most part. And so, you know, we're, these are things that we can use to say something about whether it's in placement level or, or maybe if it's brought up. Um, sure. I don't know. But. Yeah. Um, not really, it's not really something I've uh, thought very much about, uh, to be honest. Uh, a lot of it has been mostly focused on like the concentrations, uh, but it would be good to um, especially look at, um, for example, uh, how, um, how these uh, compositions change in phlogiclase um, over distances, kind of like what I was showing with uh, potassium feldspar. Um, the one thing I can say is, uh, and it's, it's been a while since I've looked at that specific uh, data, um, quite a few um, elements really don't change that much from uh, core to rim, particularly something like strontium. There is, um, there are oscillations, of course, but uh, for the most part, it's very, um, I guess, stable would be the word until you get into the rim. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank cool. you, Kevin. And I, I know I realize we need to wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, for those of you who need to go, I totally understand if you want to sign off. Uh, but I see one more hand here, and I want to give uh, Kenneth Brown the chance to ask his question, and then I yes. need to quit. <laughs> Good seeing you. Nice talk. Um, yeah, just yeah. a quick question, kind of following up on Kevin's comment mm -hmm. um, regarding the feldspars themselves. Do you know if any data exists looking specifically at the inclusions of, of say, the plagioclase inclusions within the megachrysts across those boundaries? Um, so, so I actually have some um, plagioclase data from uh, phenocrysts, not so much the megachrysts, but I'm sure they, those would be great to look at. Um, <sighs> trying to think. Um, it's only a couple, so I really don't know off the top of my head what the difference was. One thing I did notice was, um, there were at least two grains that um, seemed to fall on separate trends, but they were parallel to each other. In fact, uh, there was one grain um, from the outer margins. Actually, one of them was a megachrist, come to think of it. It was uh, from uh, Melissa Chambers, actually, um, that the outer margin fell along a parallel, but, but like really low concentration um, slope uh, compared to my uh, Cathedral Peak plagioclase data. So um, that I honestly don't really know the answer to yet, but um, I think it would be good to look at the inclusions uh, a lot more um, in greater detail. I think, you know, given Kevin's comment there about mm -hmm. using them as kind of a, a framework to build around, mm -hmm. you know, maybe looking at the inclusions with, of the feldspars within the, the potassium feldspars to see if that mixing kind of holds up across some of those boundaries. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Guys.